everybody, welcome to the Man League. I'm John, as always, and it's time for the final Shadows over Innistrad set review. We've made it! We are at the last video. We're going to cover everything that's left. That includes the 10 gold cards, the some odd number of artifacts, and the uh, dozen or so lands that are in this set. Uh, as always, there's a few disclaimers to go with this video. You should know them by now. If not, go back and start at the white video, and then go through blue, black, red, green, and then get back to this one. The main one that I'll repeat, of course, is that this is a limited set review. This is for draft and to a lesser extent sealed. I will not really be discussing if this is uh, some amazing card for somebody's obscure hippogriff EDH deck or something like that. This is about draft and limited, the two formats that I play predominantly. But without further ado, we're going to get on into the first gold card. Up uh, first, we have Altered Ego. Altered Ego is X2 green blue. For a creature shape shifter at rare, it's a 0-0, zero, zero, so of course it's going to be something else going on here. Uh, altered Ego can't be countered. That doesn't mean anything in Limited, really. Uh, you may have Altered Ego enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature on the battlefield, except it enters with X additional plus one, plus one counters. Uh, yeah, clones are good in Limited. Clones are pretty good. You can copy their bomb or even a decent utility creature or whatever they have that is decent or whatever you have that is decent if your bomb is out or something uh, uh, like that. You can also make it a little bit bigger, which is even better if you, you know, put an extra two mana into this, pay six mana total. Yours is going to be two bigger than theirs or the other copy of it uh, that you have. Uh, I, I like that as the game goes on, this just gets better and better and better. So, you know, with eight mana, you could copy their 3-3, three, three, making it a 7-7 a seven, seven version of itself. So as the game goes on and you get more mana, it actually matters less what you're copying. You could copy their little 3-3 flyer and make it gigantic. You don't have to have a game-ending bomb on their side of the table or yours to make your own. Uh, the other thing that I really like about this is that you could make X be zero. You can just play this as a four mana clone that just directly copies it. Uh, so as soon as you hit four mana, this thing's online, which I like quite a bit. Now, of course, being a gold card, I don't really think this is ever first pickable. You probably don't want to commit to a color uh, combination that early just for this card. Uh, but pack two, pack three, once you know you're in those colors or, or even thinking about that color pair, that's when you probably want to snap this up. Uh, otherwise, kind of mid to late pack one. But I love this card. I love clones and the fact that you can make bigger. Totally awesome. B+. Plus. Next up, we have Anguished Unmaking. Anguished Unmaking is one white black for an instant at rare. Exile target non-land permanent. You lose three life. Uh, yeah, I don't care that I'm going to lose three life to pay three mana at instant speed to blow anything that I want up other than a land. Uh, that's just fantastic utility. Uh, instant speed removal that's this cheap doesn't typically exist too much. Uh, definitely not below rare, which of course is why this is rare. This uh, is an easy first pick. This is uh, 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 something that's powerful enough to take it, even though it is a gold card. Taking three life doesn't even matter. Yeah, there's going to be those really, really bad situations here and there where you're at three life or two life or one life, and this uh, is what you need to win or, or, or stay in the game and you can't cast it. But it's not going to happen too often, so I'm pretty happy with this. I would first pick it. Uh, solid, solid A. Just unconditional removal. Next up, we have Arlen Cord. Arlen Cord is two green red for a planeswalker Arlen at Mythic, and she starts with three loyalty. Her plus one ability is until end of turn, up to one target creature gets plus two, plus two, and gains vigilance and haste. Now, of course, that could be zero because it is up to one. So if you have no creatures, you're probably not going to do the plus one, but you could. She also has a zero ability. Put a 2-2 two -two green wolf creature token onto the battlefield and then transform Arlen Cord. Arlen is a werewolf. She has a flip side. Arlen embraced by the moon. This is also a planeswalker Arlen, of course. She has three abilities on this side, plus one. Creatures you control get plus one, plus one, and gain trample until end of turn. That's all creatures you have. Minus one, Arlen embraced by the moon deals three damage to target creature or player. Transform Arlen embraced by the moon. Back to her day side. Minus six, her ultimate, you get an emblem with, quote, creatures you control have haste and... Uh, nested quote, tap, this creature deals damage equal to its power to target creature or player. End nested quote, end quote. Um, yeah, Arlen, lot going on here. Quite a lot going on here. So for four mana, you're going to get a three loyalty planeswalker. That's ever so slightly dicey. Of course, you want uh, loyalty equal to mana cost usually, but three is 
pretty okay. Right away, she can pump up your big creature and get in for extra damage while keeping it as a blocker because it has vigilance and upping her loyalty. That's that's totally good. If you don't have anything to protect her, she can make a 2-2 and protect herself for the turn. And she flips on over, which is also doable. Uh, I like that you can do these in two very different situations. If you're ahead, cool, plus one that creature that you've got. If you're not ahead, if you don't have protection, zero her, and now she's got protection. Her flip side's a bit more interesting, I think. Uh, her plus one works really well if you're really wide and have a lot of creatures going on. And if you're not in a board stall, you should finish the game out pretty darn quick if, with that. And even if you are in a board stall, it may be what you need to break it. Her minus one is pretty decent removal for a fair number of things, but you only get to use it every other turn at best, because of course you use it and she flips over, and then you have to make a wolf to get that ability back and flip her over. Um, you're looking at a minimum of five turns after casting her to get off her ultimate, which... I think is a little bit unrealistic. Uh, in that time, you should have been able to finish the game by using her other abilities, either using her plus one on the day side or using her uh, plus one on the uh, flip side. Um, ultimately, I think she's pretty darn solid as a utility kind of creature-based planeswalker. I really like that she's super good if you have one creature or super good if you have a board full of creatures. Uh, you just kind of have to pick which side you want to get her onto. Um, I love the removal aspect. I think the ultimate is... is nice but a little bit unrealistic to get her other abilities are what you should really be using uh, but I think she's totally fine totally first pickable just straight up solid A all right, let's get a little bit less splashy. Up next, we have Fevered Visions. Fevered Visions is one blue-red for an enchantment at rare. At the beginning of each player's end step, that player draws a card. If the player is your opponent and has four or more cards in hand, Fevered Visions deals two damage to him or her. Uh, yeah, this is generally going to just be Howling Mind at the end step instead of the draw step. Uh, in Limited, I feel like players pretty quickly have three or less cards usually. So I think it's going to be just kind of a symmetrical draw spell usually. Uh, is Howling Mine good in Limited? I actually don't know. I haven't played with it outside of like a couple of times in Cube, and I, I don't think it's that good in Limited. I, I don't think you want such a symmetrical effect happening. Um, unless your opponent is rather strangely not emptying their hand, which they do anyways in limited and now they have an even better reason to do it then i think you're just kind of speeding the game up with no real advantage to either person you're, you're just making the game go uh you know a, a turn faster than it would have this just doesn't seem that good to me it doesn't seem like an advantage to any one person it just seems like a way to put the game on fast forward so i'm not really a, a fan of this card i don't think i'll take it all that highly i don't think i'll ever look to play it so I've got to go with a C- minus on it. Maybe there's a way to really take advantage of this. Maybe in blue-red, if you do that spells deck, you, you want to be drawing your spells super fast and you don't care what your opponent's drawing, but I don't know. It, it just seems wonky to me. So C-, minus. I, I'm not super uh, uh, super big fan of this. Next up, we have the Gitrog Monster. The Gitrog Monster is three black-green for a legendary creature, Frog Horror, at Mythic. It's a 6-6. Six, six. It's got Death Touch. At the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice the Gitrog Monster, unless you sacrifice a land. You may play an additional land on each of your turns. Whenever one or more land cards are put into the graveyard from anywhere, draw a card. Uh, I'm not sure how to grade this guy exactly for limited. It's good, no doubt, but how good? Uh, it's a 5-mana 6-6 six, six Death Touch. That's... Totally solid. Trample would be nice, but whatever. Totally solid. Sacking a land every turn is a pretty serious downside, but that sacked land does turn into a card, which hopefully will draw you more lands. Uh, if you're playing multiple lands on turn six and on, though, it does mean you're flooding out. So just because this says you can play an extra land each turn, don't expect that that means that you're always playing two lands each turn. I mean, and then didn't do that for you. This isn't going to do that for you. Um, if you're drawing into spells, you're watching your land base tick down in exchange for those draws. But thankfully, it is a choice. You, you can just let Frogzilla die at any point that you feel you can't lose any more lands. Ultimately, I think this is pretty darn solid, probably first pickable, and it should pull its own weight pretty well. I just don't feel comfortable going higher than A-. I feel like there is a very fine line you have to walk with this guy and you need to know when you should be sacking it when you should be saying okay i can't throw away more lands um be careful with this guy i think he's solid i think he's pretty good a minus but be careful 
Next up, we have Invocation of Saint Traft. Invocation of Saint Traft is one white blue for an enchantment aura at rare. It says enchant creature, enchanted creature has, whenever this creature attacks, put a 4-4 of white angel creature token with flying onto the battlefield, tapped and attacking, exile that token at the end of combat. So it gives you the uh, rules text from Geist of Saint Traft, except of course for Hexproof. Uh, yeah, there are auras that are tempting me in this set. We've talked about Griff's Boon, we've talked about uh, Ghostly Wings, and now we're going to talk about Invocation of Saint Traft. This ability is big, but it has to be on something that can attack pretty much with impunity and uh, isn't terribly vulnerable. Now, luckily, this is in white and blue, the color of flyers, so if you're really lucky... You can maybe throw this on a two or three drop flyer before your opponent has flyers or reachy guys and start getting in with a very fast clock. Your opponent is going to have to kill the creature that this is on or else they're going to die very fast. But the creature is very vulnerable. Geist was okay because it had Hexproof. Now it was a 2-2, which means it died in ground combat basically always. Um, but the creature you put the aura on is super vulnerable, and that, of course, is the biggest problem with auras in general. You know, a, a relatively cheap spell can typically just blow the creature up, and you've wasted two cards and a whole bunch of mana, and they've finished it off with, you know, a two- or three-drop kill spell. So, yeah, I, I have a feeling that I'm being tempted by this, and it's going to end up not being as good as I want it to be, but I'm so tempted by it. I, I want to fly in on Impeded with, you know, six damage or, or seven damage uh, from my flyer and the extra flying angel, but, uh, all right, my tempted grade is a B-. minus. I'm tempted to not first pick it, but to play it every single time I have it, and when I know I'm in blue-white, take it every single time I see it. B minus. Realistically, I know this is probably more like a C or a C minus, and you probably shouldn't play it, but I'm going to ignore the real world the first time that I have a chance to play this card and play it heavily, uh, and then I'll probably learn my lesson and go to the more realistic grade. Next up, we have another Planeswalker, because why not? We have Nahiri the Harbinger. Nahiri the Harbinger is two red-white for a Planeswalker Nahiri. She's a mythic. She's got four loyalty to start, so here we go. Here's four mana for four loyalty. Her plus two says you may discard a card. If you do, draw a card. So uh, you can plus two for free, or you can plus two and rummage. Minus two, exile target enchantment, tapped artifact, or tapped creature. Uh, minus eight, her ultimate, search your library for an artifact or creature card, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. It gains haste, return it to your hand at the beginning of the next end step. Nahiri seems decent. She is four mana for four loyalty, as I said, which is pretty solid. Passes the kind of uh, Planeswalker vanilla test. Her plus two is nice in that it's totally free, even if you don't have a card to discard. So even if you're top decking, you can still plus two her. Now, of course, if you're in uh, uh, red-white, you've probably got some red madness cards kicking around, and so it's going to be an even better bonus. You're going to get to, uh, uh, hopefully, if you have the mana, cast the madness card and draw a card for free, essentially, which will be nice, but uh, we'll talk about madness uh, in, in the, uh, the overview a little bit later in this video. Um, going on to her minus two, it's nice enough, but it does give a ton of control to your opponent on when you get to use it. They know that removal option is on the table, so they're going to be very careful about what they tap with their artifacts and with their creatures. Still, that might encourage your opponent to not attack otherwise, and maybe that will buy you time to uh, do some other stuff. Uh, her final ability is cute, but it's going to be really hard to pull it off in draft, I think. You're going to need another crazy bomb in your deck past Nahiri, not have drawn it, and you're going to need to get it in with it and or have it uh, have some sort of really good end of the battlefield effect in order to really use it. Otherwise, you're paying eight loyalty for a card that gets chump blocked or something. Ultimately, I think she's going to be fine for limited, but I don't think she's going to be quite Obnixilis, Gideon, uh, even Arlen or Jace level. Uh, I think she's really kind of a B-plus Planeswalker. You'll never, of course, pass her. You'll always pick a Planeswalker in draft basically always, unless it's like pro tour level or something. Um, but realistically, I think she's a B-plus Planeswalker. Next up, we have Olivia Mobilized for War. Olivia Mobilized for War is one black red for a legendary creature vampire knight at Mythic. She's a 3-3. She flies. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may discard a card. 
If you do, put a plus one plus one counter on that creature. It gains haste until end of turn, and it becomes a vampire in addition to its other types. Yeah, 3-3 three, three flyer for three, totally fine. I'm on board right there. It could say nothing else, and I would probably play this, especially in black-red, which isn't exactly known for uh, a whole bunch of flyers. The ability is quite cool to give your creatures a permanent buff, maybe giving them some vampire synergy, and uh, even giving them haste is pretty darn nice. That's definitely going to give you quite a bonus to your board. Your creatures are suddenly going to be uh, one power and one toughness better than they should be for what you're casting them. And I think that's going to uh, result in a whole lot of damage getting through, especially with haste. Your opponent basically has to always have blockers back because what on earth are you going to play next? Now I see or I saw, I haven't seen a lot of it lately, a lot of people saying, oh, madness as well. So I can uh, play a creature and discard my vampire madness creature and cast that and, and, and then do this and do this. You don't have infinite mana. <laughs> you, you just don't have infinite mana. You have to cast the creature that allows you to discard a card, which means you have to have mana left over if it's a madness creature to cast that creature, and you're not going to chain them together. That's probably going to be the end of Magical Christmas Land, is playing a creature, discarding a madness creature, and then playing that and discarding something else. You're probably not going to get any more than that unless you have some ridiculous amount of mana. Um, so don't get too Magical Christmas Land on this, but this thing is still absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. The 3-3 three, three for 3 flyer, as I said, is where I'm already on board. The ability to give your things haste and permanent buffs is just even better. Uh, I'm not really looking at this as a madness enabler. I'm just looking at it as a, a, a hasty black-red aggro bomb. Uh, I will probably always first pick Olivia. I think she's a solid A. Uh, just don't get too magical Christmas landy with her uh, uh, potential madness enabling. Next up, we have Prized Amalgam. Prized Amalgam is one blue-black for a creature zombie at rare. It's a 3-3, three, three, and it says whenever a creature enters the battlefield, if it entered from your graveyard or you cast it from your graveyard, return Prized Amalgam from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped at the beginning of the next end step. This is constructed only. Absolutely constructed only. There are six things or ways to get something from the graveyard to the battlefield in this set. Three of them are mythic, so there's a very good chance you'll just never see them in conjunction with Prized Amalgam. Two of them are uncommon, so there's an okay chance that you might see one of them maybe in conjunction with Prized Amalgam, and one is a rare spell that isn't very good. So this ability on this card is just not gonna happen. It's just not. Sometimes, yes, absolutely, and if you pull it off, cool, good job, you might get this back on the battlefield once. But realistically, on average, this is, just isn't going to happen. This is a vanilla 3-3. Three, three. Uh, this has a, a bunch of constructed applications in, of course, zombie decks and EDH and casual and modern and standard, maybe, especially with the new set when it comes out, who knows, maybe. Limited, this format, no. This is a vanilla 3-3 three, three and, and very little else. Um... Now, it is a 3-3 three, three for 3, which means it's slightly better than the usual 3-3 uh, three, three for 4, so I am willing to give this a C+. Plus. Of course, you have to be blue-black for that to be a C+, plus anywhere else, and it's uh, significantly less. I wouldn't splash for this. It's just not very good. It's not first pickable. It's uh, barely, barely, barely mid-pack pickable, and that's only if you know you are blue-black. So, C+. Plus. Fantastic in other formats, but just not this one. Not in draft. Not in sealed. Next up, we have Sigarda Heron's Grace. Sigarda Heron's Grace is three green-white for a legendary creature, Angel at Mythic. She's a 4-5. She has flying. You and humans you control have hexproof, so spells can't target you. Uh, pay two, exile a card from your graveyard, put a 1-1 one, one white human soldier creature token onto the battlefield. Uh, yeah, so Sigarda is a 5-mana 4-5 flyer, which is totally fine. Uh, giving hopefully a solid chunk of your team and you hexproof is pretty nice. Uh, it leaves her as a pretty tasty removal target, but they are going to have to remove her before they can touch anything else on your battlefield. Uh, Green-White will, of course, be one of the human decks, and there's a bajillion humans kicking around in this format. Uh, Green-White was the best deck in the original Innistrad. Who knows if it will stick around this time, but it should be a pretty solid Green-White humans deck, and this will be some amazing icing on that cake. Uh, the ability I'm not 
super sure about. You can do it when you can. And, you know, a 1-1 a one, one token that has Hexproof is going to be fine. And hopefully there's going to be some other synergy going on. Uh, but still, just for the body and the first ability alone, this is totally first pickable and pretty bomby. And that second ability is just kind of gravy whenever you can do it. Um, yeah, pretty darn happy with Sigarda Heron's Grace. I think she's totally first pickable. Uh, solid, solid A. Next up, we have, yes, another Planeswalker. There are four in this set, breaking precedent. Uh, we have Soren Grim Nemesis. Soren Grim Nemesis is four white-black for a Planeswalker Soren at Mythic. He starts with six loyalty counters, so he passes the Planeswalker vanilla test as well. Uh, his plus one is reveal the top card of your library and put that card into your hand. Each opponent loses life equal to its CMC. Minus X. Soren, Grim Nemesis, deals X damage to target creature or planeswalker, and you gain X life. His ultimate is minus 9. Put a number of 1-1 one, one black vampire knight creature tokens with lifelink onto the battlefield equal to the highest life total among all players. So he's a 6 mana planeswalker, which is pricey. 6 mana planeswalkers have to be pretty darn solid in order for you to uh, really want them to be, uh, you know, uh, something in your deck. Uh, luckily, they have in recent history been pretty good. Uh, I'm thinking of Elspeth's son's champion, who was quite solid. Um, but six mana for six loyalty is fantastic, even if this was just a damage sponge, but it's much more than a damage sponge. Uh, his plus one is just flat out card advantage with some incidental damage. Um, remember, if, you're do if your deck is chock full of four, five, six mana spells, you're probably losing. So it's not like you're going to be flipping five mana after five mana spell you're going to be flipping a lot of two drops three drops a lot of lands as well which are going to do nothing but you're still getting the card advantage at a bare minimum very happy with this plus one totally fine his minus x is super solid because uh at worst this could just be a six mana six damage spell and uh six drain at that you get six life off of it and of course hopefully that's not what you have to be doing hopefully you're playing this and picking off a three three or picking off an x two or even picking off an x one and gaining some life um yeah just a great way of protecting himself uh it doesn't make a token or you know something that's going to stand in the way but as long as there's just one target or as long as you have some blockers, uh, it's going to be a, a pretty good way of keeping Soren safe and getting you some life and uh, uh, making the board a little bit more clear. His ultimate is uh, boring, and it's not going to do anything, I think, in Limited a lot of the time. By the time you get Soren to 9, if you ever do, I would hope that the person with the highest life total is maybe 10 or so, you know, turn what? We're looking at turn nine or 10 or plus. You can't really expect the highest life total to still be 20 or above. It's going to be relatively low. Now, if you still make 10 one ones, that's that's no joke whatsoever. Uh, but I wouldn't live too much in Magical Christmas land of this being, you know, 20 one ones running around or anything like that. Still, as long as it makes a sizable number of one ones, it's definitely an option. But it's going to be fantastic just to have him at nine and be able to minus X him to kill probably anything you want on the battlefield. Soren's definitely no joke. He's a little bit expensive, so there will be times where he's just sitting in your hand for way too long, but I think he is still solid and first pickable. I think he is better than Nahiri and uh, probably just ever so slightly uh, less good than Arlen, and it's almost entirely because of his mana cost. So I'm going to go with A-, minus, totally first pickable, and uh, when he hits the battlefield, I think you're going to be in very good shape. Uh, it's just uh, the when that ever so slightly holds him back. All right, that's going to wrap it up for gold cards. There's one for each color combination, and almost all of them are pretty darn solid. Fevered Visions, I'm looking at you. Uh, prize to Malcolm as well. Um, but anyways, let's move on to the artifacts and discuss all of them. Up first, we have Brain in a Jar. Brain in a Jar is two generic mana for an artifact at rare. You can pay one and tap it to put a charge counter on Brain in a Jar. Then, you may cast an instant sorcery card with converted mana cost equal to the number of charge counters on Brain in a Jar from your hand without paying its mana cost. Or, you can pay three, tap it, to remove X charge counters from Brain in a Jar to scry X. Ugh, 
constructed maybe, and even then it's going to be kind of casual. Uh, I would like to see hilarious things done with this, but in limited, it's just a no. You have so few instants and sorceries in the average deck, and they're rarely going to work in a nice ladder fashion of one drop, two drop, three drop, four drop. They're all going to cluster around, you know, two, three, four maybe five drops and you may not have a, a nice ladder to get through which means you would have to spend a lot of mana and turns tapping this to put counters on it for no real reason trying to get up to that uh, point that you want um, you don't even know what point you're going to be wanting I mean you know what cards in your deck but you don't know when you're going to draw them so unless it's already in your hand you're not even sure which number you should really stop on um, you can get some scry later in the game but you've put so much mana and so much work into this card just to get some scry that i don't think it's worth it um yeah as well you are just paying for the spell eventually you know you are paying the mana cost of the spell it's just you're paying it over several 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 turns um this is not aether vial not at all don't even think that this is anywhere near the power of aether vial i don't like brain in the jar i don't think you should ever play it i've got to go with a solid f on it up next, we have Corrupted Graphstone. Corrupted Graphstone is two generic mana for an artifact. At rare, Corrupted Graphstone enters the battlefield tapped. Tap, choose a color of a card in your graveyard. Add one mana of that color to your mana pool. So we have here a mana rock. Mana rocks are pretty good, especially when they only cost two mana. That's, uh, that's rather good. Comes into play tapped, which is not very good. Oh, and it's also dead several amounts of time it's dead if you don't have a card in the graveyard uh, of the color that you want to generate or if you don't have anything in the graveyard at all the fact that this card could do literally nothing a very non-zero amount of the time makes me want to avoid this a fair bit it's not first pickable i don't even think it's mid-pack pickable um, it's rare because of the complexity of it i'm sure because you have to pick a card and make any color um, but it doesn't feel rare i have a feeling this is going to be the rare that i'm going to hate opening in a pack i'm going to open i'm going to flip back to my rare and i'm going to go oh and then try to figure out which common or uncommon i want to take instead this also feels like an f to me i just don't think you ever want to play this it's literally does nothing some of the time and when it does do something it's just kind of mildly okay if it didn't enter the battlefield tapped I might consider it, but entering the battlefield tapped and being a dead card some amount of the time, just another solid F for me. Next up, we have Epitaph Golem. Epitaph Golem is five generic mana for an artifact creature Golem at Uncommon. It's a 3-5, and it has an ability to pay two generic mana, put target card from your graveyard on the bottom of your library. This really feels like they said, oh, hey, we need this to be Uncommon. We need an ability that isn't really going to impact anything ever let's go with this one unless this is foreshadowing an upcoming mechanic like i don't know reveal the bottom card of your library something happens uh unless that's a thing in eldritch moon or something i just don't really see the point of this ability this is basically just a vanilla three five for five which is kind of okay you know it's just like twins of maurer estate but that at least has a madness cost we maybe can play that for three otherwise this is just a vanilla three five which you know, it's kind of okay if you're in a slow control deck. The real upside of this is that it's two card types for Delirium. If this is in your graveyard, you're 50% of the way to Delirium with a single card. Now, getting a 3-5 to the graveyard is a little bit tricky because it takes an awful lot to kill a 3-5, and your opponent's probably not really going to be looking to waste removal on this. So you're going to need to be discarding this or, or sacking it or something like that, um, which just is not how I want to be playing cards for Delirium. I, d I don't want to play cards that my entire plan is I want it in the graveyard. I, I don't want it to ever do anything else. I just want it in the graveyard. Just isn't really what I want to be doing with this thing. So C minus, I think you'll cut it more often than not. Um, kind of sucks that it's an uncommon, but oh well. Next up, we have Explosive Apparatus. Explosive Apparatus is a single generic mana for an artifact at common. Pay three generic mana, tap it, sack it. Explosive Apparatus deals two damage to target creature or player. Um, in the end, this costs the same as Vial of Dragonfire. Vial of Dragonfire was two mana, two tap sack to do two damage. Uh, this is a 1-3 split instead of a 2-2 two -two split. It does hit players, though. Uh, I don't believe Vial of Dragonfire did, so it can finish off a game. Still, Vial wasn't really a card you wanted to play. It was pretty slow, and you obviously really telegraphed that you were going to kill something. Uh, you know, unless you cast it for four, 
which is starting to get a little bit too late and a little bit too expensive to do two damage. Um, yeah, it just doesn't seem that great. I, I think you'll play this as a 23rd card if you have to. Uh, maybe if you're playing Delirium, it's ever so slightly better because it's an artifact that you want to end up in the graveyard after having done some value out of it. But really, I think this is just a C- minus a good deal of the time. You'll cut it more often than you won't. You'll play it the few times that you, you kind of need it. Next up, we have Harvest Hand. Harvest Hand is a three generic mana for an artifact creature, Scarecrow at Uncommon. It's a 2-2. When Harvest Hand dies, return it to the battlefield, transformed under your control. It becomes a scrounged scythe, so somebody picks up its hand and uses it as a weapon. It's an artifact equipment. Equipped creature gets plus one, plus one. As long as equipped creature is a human, it has menace. Equip two generic mana. Uh, so it's a 2-2 two, two for three, which is slightly overcosted. Uh, you know, we, we would prefer to have a 2-2 two, two being two mana, not being three mana. But when it dies, you get some value out of it by having a, a, a measly little equipment that gives plus one, plus one, which is never great. But after getting it off of a 2-2, two, two, it's not the worst. If it's in a human deck, which generally is where you want the equipment to be, then uh, you're going to be able to give one of your creatures menace as well as plus one, plus one, which still just doesn't really seem worth it, to be honest, uh, for the equip cost of two. Doesn't seem like that great of a card. It seems pretty filler to me, especially because it's a 2-2 two, two for three as opposed to a 2-2 two, two for two. It doesn't even help you like the other artifact creatures do because it doesn't stay in the graveyard to enable delirium. So, you know, uh, I'm just kind of ambivalent about this card really uh middle of the road c is kind of where i want to end up with it i could play this i could not play this and i don't think i would really care either way just middle of the road c total 23rd card to me Next up, we have Haunted Cloak. Haunted Cloak is three generic mana for an artifact equipment at Uncommon. Equipped creature has Vigilance, Trample, and Haste. Equip one generic mana. Um, not really what I want to be playing. Four mana in order to get Trample, which is fine, but without a power boost. I don't really want to pay four mana just for Trample. You get Vigilance, which is the most boring of evergreen keywords. It's just not enough to have Vigilance as a, a, a thing that's being granted. Vigilance is just kind of like a, oh, that's kind of cool that it has that. It's never an amazing thing like First Strike or Double Strike or Flying or anything like that. And you also get Haste, which is good for exactly one turn and then is flavor text. This just doesn't seem worth it in most cases. Uh, I'll keep this in the board almost always. D+, plus. this is your typical kind of garbage equipment that newer players will go "Ooh, look at all those abilities and uh as they become better players they'll say oh it's just a bunch of abilities next up we have magnifying glass magnifying glass is three generic mana for an artifact at uncommon tap add colorless to your mana pool pay four generic tap investigate uh yeah so colorless mana has no purpose in this uh in this draft format I don't expect colorless to be something that shows up in most sets that was uh, an oath of the gatewatch kind of thing it's not going to be a, a thing that permeates all sets from now on so this is just a mana rock and three mana mana rocks are fine they need to have some sort of solid useful ability like scry a la Sears Lantern to be really, really, really good. Um, but they're still fine-ish. Um, investigate for four means that you draw a card for six mana, which seems a little bit pricey and less relevant than uh, Pay 2 and Scry. Still, it's a place to dump your mana late in the game, and it's a, a ramp spell at three, which is fine. I think this goes in the most controlling of decks and maybe in ramp, but otherwise I'm just not super interested in this, and I think it's much less good than Sears Lantern was, and Sears Lantern I think was kind of C, C+, plus, so this kind of falls to a C-. minus. Next up, we have Murderer's Axe. Murderer's Axe is four generic mana for an artifact equipment at Uncommon. Equipped creature gets plus two, plus two. Equip, discard a card. So you don't pay any mana, you just discard a card for this. Still, it is four mana and a discard for plus two, plus two, which isn't that great. So hopefully that discard was a madness card. Um, so you didn't truly discard a card, you just actually cast it a card. But even still, it's four mana for plus two, plus two. Um, if you've got 
some of the, you know, you really want to cast this for madness or else, you know, normally casting the card just isn't that good, then maybe this is okay as a, a, another madness outlet. But otherwise, I don't think you should probably play this. Um, I'll talk about madness a little bit more later in this video, but I don't think you really want to play this. Yes, it's a way to enable madness, but I think there's just a billion better ways to go about it than uh, this piddly little piece of equipment here. Next up, we have Neglected Heirloom. Neglected Heirloom is a single mana for an artifact equipment at Uncommon. Equipped creature gets plus one, plus one. When equipped creature transforms, transform Neglected Heirloom. And the equip cost is a single generic mana as well. Now that I like. A single mana to cast, a single mana to equip. That is the level that I start to like having equipment at. Now, plus one, plus one isn't that great. It's fine, but I probably wouldn't play that card. But if I put this on anything that transforms and that creature then transforms, it becomes Ashmouth Blade. Ashmouth Blade is an artifact equipment and the equipped creature gets plus three, plus three and has first strike with an equip cost of three. Three is a little bit much, but plus three, plus three and first strike is fantastic. And the fact that uh, when I put this on the transform creature, I only paid one and it becomes plus three, plus three and first strike is really good. Um, this is getting really close to the kind of equipment that I actually like, you know, powerful stuff. The day side is fine. As I said, plus one, plus one uh, for one cast and one equip isn't great, but it's okay. But the fact that it becomes plus three, plus three first strike is uh, the real deal. Uh, this is what I want to have with Abyssinian missionaries. This is what I want to have with uh, werewolves, etc. Um, generally, this should make any creature that it's on win in combat, especially with the first strike clause. Uh, I definitely want to give this a try and see how it works out. Uh, be aware, though, if you don't end up with enough uh, double face cards, this is basically worthless. If you don't, this is just a plus one plus one equipment, which isn't really playable. So make sure that you do have a critical mass of double faced cards. I'm going to say probably a minimum of six or seven and i think that may be a little bit low uh this is going to be most at home i think in red green werewolves because you're going to have the uh the best chance at getting a critical mass of flip cards otherwise i think you probably want to be black white humans or green white humans but just make sure you have enough double face cards to play this if you do i think it's a pretty solid card that you should always play uh, i'm going to go with a c plus on it uh as well i think you probably want to go double faced cards and then pick this up. I don't think you want to pick this up with the plan and hope of getting enough double face cards. So beware, C+. Next up, we have Runaway Carriage. Runaway Carriage is four generic mana for an artifact creature construct at Uncommon. It's a five, six, it has trample, and when Runaway Carriage attacks or blocks, sacrifice it at the end of combat. Um, meh. Again, I think the main reason for this thing is to have two types on one card for your Delirium. Other than that, this is just such a terrible creature. You don't really play Lava Axe. A Lava Axe being, I think, four and a red for uh, a spell that does five damage to a player's face. It doesn't kill creatures or anything like that. It's just five damage to their face, and you generally shouldn't play that in Limited. This doesn't even always do five to their face. Sometimes it kills a creature when they jump block. Sometimes it bounces off a creature, although if they have a, a six toughness creature or better, you're probably in a bad situation. Or even worse, it just blocks something and uh, maybe kills it, hopefully kills it as a five, six, and then it sacrifices. Ugh. I just don't see this being something that I really want to play, even if I'm that desperate to enable delirium. It, it's... You could argue it's a type of removal, but it's the worst type of removal I've ever seen. Um, I, I'm going to pass this and probably not play it ever, really. I've got to go with a D on it. If you're desperate for Delirium, maybe, but generally I think it's just a D. Next up, we have Shard of Broken Glass. Shard of Broken Glass is a single generic mana for an artifact equipment at common. It has an equip cost of one. I just said I kind of like uh, equipment that is this cheap. What does it do? Well, it gives your creature plus one, plus zero. And whenever the equipped creature attacks, you may put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard. That's pretty darn bad. Uh, plus one, plus zero is not 
good. I, I was kind of okay with plus one, plus one, with the promise of it potentially being something amazing like Ashmouth Blade. Plus one, plus zero is really darn weak if you're not getting first strike or something attached to it. And you get two blind flips into your graveyard, which I guess if you're incredibly desperate for delirium, this is a way to go about it. Um, but no, I don't think you should ever play this. I think this is one of the worst ways to enable delirium that you could ever think of. Uh, <laughs> I think this is a solid F. I don't think this card should ever be played. And I'm going to be very happy to see it on the other side of the table. Very, very happy to see somebody spend mana casting this and equipping it. So play it if you want, but I'm pretty sure it's an F. Next up, we have Skeleton Key. Skeleton Key is a single generic mana for an artifact equipment and uncommon. Equip cost of two, equipped creature has Skulk, and whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, you may draw a card. If you do, discard a card. I like this. This seems totally fine to me. It's a cheap cost to cast, it's a relatively cheap equip cost, and it's a solid pair of effects. Giving Skulk to one of your one power things, like a 1-4 or a 1-3, or giving it to a 2-4 or something, and being able to make it hopefully be unblockable, and then when it hits, it's a looter uh, ill core? Is that what it was? That's what I think the shadow looter is that's in a lot of cubes, uh, including my cube. Um, yeah, loot is a fantastic ability to give to something that has pseudo unblockableness or, or sometimes is unblockable um, and, and for such a low cost I'm actually relatively okay with this um, I won't go out of my way but I think if I see it and, and it's kind of the you know one of the last few cards for me in a pack I'll probably take it and I'll probably play one of these it's it, it's it's equipment I'm not too unhappy with. I, I like it. And of course, if I have an Abyssinian Missionaries or something, it gets even better if something actually cares about equipment. Uh, yeah, we've done it, guys. We've found another piece of equipment that I'm kind of okay playing. I'm, I'm not happy to play it, but I'm, I'm kind of okay with it. C+. Plus. Next up, we have Slayer's Plate. Slayer's Plate is three generic mana for an artifact equipment at rare. Equip cost of three. Equipped creature gets plus four, plus two. Whenever equipped creature dies, if it was a human, put a 1-1 one, one white spirit creature token with flying onto the battlefield. Uh, this is beefy. It's costly, but beefy. It's not something that I personally typically go for just because it's really clunky to me to pay three to play this and then pay three whenever I want to equip it. But plus four, plus two isn't something to scoff at. That makes a 2-2 two, two into a 6-4. That's a big change. And if it uh, was a human and it dies, you get a 1-1 one, one spirit out of it. And then, of course, you can slap the plate on the spirit and you've got yourself a 5-3 flyer. Yeah, this is this is big. It's so costly, though. Um, I have a feeling I'm probably not going to play this and not give it a chance. But that's just me. I think I will certainly get blown out by this here and there. And I think if you have it, you should generally play it. Unless you're in a hyper-aggressive deck that just doesn't want to spend the time and turns to cast and equip this. Um, I don't think you take it terribly highly. But I think, it is a, uh, I think it is playable. I think it's an option. Personally, I'm probably going to avoid it. But I think it's probably a C+. Next up, we have Tamio's Journal. Tamio's Journal is five generic mana for a legendary artifact at rare. At the beginning of your upkeep, investigate. Tap, sacrifice three clues, search your library for a card, and put that card into your hand. Then shuffle your library. Uh, clue every turn is fine. That's totally fine. I, I don't know that I want to pay five mana for that. Sacking three clues to tutor is also fine, although tutors aren't exactly the best in limited generally. That five is such a tough cost though, and it basically says that this only goes into a super grindy long game control deck, uh, which would probably be somewhat okay with playing this. But turn five at a minimum, that means that you're not tutoring until turn eight at an absolute minimum. Um, maybe if you're in the blue-green clues deck, you already have the clues ready, but you're still looking at turn five at a minimum to tutor, and that's getting a little bit late to tutor. Um, I feel like I'd be more inclined to just cash the clues in for a card each turn as opposed to waiting and waiting and waiting. Ultimately, I think this is just going to fall flat, so I'm going to start a little bit down on it. I'm at a C plus on it. I don't think I'll be first picking this. Uh, 
if I have it and I'm kind of blue, black, grindy or something like that, I'll, I'll probably give it a go sometime, but I'm going to start at C+. Next up, we have Thraben Gargoyle. Thraben Gargoyle is a single mana for an artifact creature gargoyle at Uncommon. It's a 2-2, and it's got Defender. Pay 6 generic mana, transform Thraben Gargoyle for 6 mana. What does it turn into? It turns into a 4-2 flyer. Nothing else. Just a 4-2 flyer. Ah, uh, yeah. The nice thing about this, of course, is that it's two card types for Delirium. If you really want to try Delirium, I think this guy's one of the ways to go about it because it's such a low cost, and you could potentially just throw it away as a 2-2, trading with your opponent's 2-2. They attack. You say, yeah, sure, I'll trade. Haha, <laughs> I'm 50% of the way to Delirium, just like that, and I got rid of a creature. However, it is a terrible creature. It's a 2-2 defender. That's, that's, that's not great. Thankfully, it's just a single mana, but that's still not great. And then six mana gets you a 4-2 flyer. That just dies to a million things. That dies to a pair of spirit tokens. Um, just seems way too slow, way too cute, and way too easy to get blown out pumping six mana into this to transform it just to have it die. I'm out on this for anything but a Delirium Helper, and even then it's just one card in your deck, so I don't think you can take this and go, haha, Delirium's always on, because that's one out of 40 of your cards. You still need to draw it, play it, and have it die and or discard it. So I'm going to go with a C- minus on it. I don't think it's that amazing. Just a C-. minus. Just a couple more artifacts to go. We've got True Faith Sensor. True Faith Sensor is two generic mana for an artifact equipment at common. A equipped creature gets plus one, plus one, and has vigilance. As long as equipped creature is a human, it gets an additional plus one, plus zero. Equip cost of two. So we're looking at four mana to get this on something. This is not Butcher's Cleaver. This isn't even really Silver Inlaid Dagger, both of which were playable-ish equipment in Innistrad. Plus one, plus one in Vigilance isn't really worth a card. Plus two, plus one in Vigilance in a heavy human deck still isn't really worth a card or, or four mana that it costs to equip this. 23rd card, maybe, but not really something I want to play. Goes up ever so slightly if you have Abyssinian and Missionaries, but this just isn't something I really want to touch. C minus, if you have to, sure, it's a 23rd card, but it's not for me. Next up, we have Wicker Witch. Wicker Witch is three generic mana for an artifact creature scarecrow at common, and it's a 3-1. You know me, I like three ones for two. I don't really care for three ones for three unless they do something, and this does nothing at all other than be an artifact creature for Delirium. Double Delirium card type, blah, blah, blah. You've heard that several times. Um, not really what I want to play, but a 23rd card or 22nd if you really want to enable Delirium. C minus, I'm going to cut it pretty regularly. Finally, we have Wild Field Scarecrow. Wild Field Scarecrow is three generic mana for an artifact creature scarecrow at Uncommon. It's a 1-4. It's got Defender. And for two generic mana, you can sacrifice Wild Field Scarecrow to search your library for up to two basic lands, reveal them, and then put them into your hand. And then, of course, shuffle your library. It's a three mana 1-4, which is fine. That's going to block... Almost everything in the format at three mana and below. Uh, and it's going to kill an awful lot of the two ones and three ones that are hanging around while still living. And then a little bit later on, you can sack it, go get a couple of lands, uh, get a double card type into your yard for Delirium. Those lands go into your hand, which is pretty slow, but it's okay. It, it'll help you fix your mana a little bit. I think this really helps out playing a three plus color deck. And I think it's almost required to play a three plus color deck to have one of these or something similar. Uh, in a traditional two color deck, I think this becomes a little bit less playable, a little bit more of a sideboard card if you find yourself getting run over. Um, really seems like a keep it or leave it kind of card, to be honest. So I'm going to go with a middle of the road C. All right, let's move on to the lands. Up first, we have a cycle of rare lands. We have Choked Estuary, Foreboding Ruins, Fortified Village, Game Trail, and Port Town. Each of these say, as name of the card here, let's go with Choked Estuary, enters the battlefield. You may reveal an island or swamp or whatever the two basic land types are of the colors produced by the land. Card from your hand. If you don't, Choked Estuary enters the battlefield tapped. Tap, add blue or black to your mana pool or whatever two colors the land in question produces. Uh, I've been calling these hand lands because you reveal something from your hand. The official boring name is shadow lands. Um, but yeah, these are, you know, run-of-the-mill dual lands at rare. Same old, same old. You take this if you need it. You don't if you don't. 
Generally, I would consider this to be a tap land. And uh, if I have a land, cool. You know, early on, this probably won't be a tap land. Later in the game, it'll probably be a tap land. Use them the same way you would the uncommon tap lands from Oath and be pleasantly surprised the times that you can power them in on tapped early uh, if you, uh, you know, have them in your opening hand. Uh, yeah, middle of the road C. You're, you're not going to first pick these unless you're really desperately value drafting. Um, but if you're in those colors, cool. If you're splashing, not too bad. Middle of the road C. Next up, we have Drown Yard Temple. Drown Yard Temple is a land at rare. Tap, add colorless mana to your mana pool. Pay three generic mana. Return Drown Yard Temple from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Why? Why? I don't get it. It taps for colorless mana, which we don't need. We don't need colorless mana. So why would we play this instead of a basic land? And then if it ends up in our graveyard because we sacrificed it or discarded it or milled it, we can pay three to get this land back tapped that we don't really want anyways. I just don't really get it. I mean, maybe if you get yourself a Gitrog monster and you get yourself a Drownyard Temple, you can sack this to the Gitrog monster and then return it and then sack it and then you have permanent food for the Gitrog monster. That is way too much work and way too unlikely that you're going to get both of these cards in a draft or a sealed event to even care about it. This just seems like a stone cold F to me. If you do not have the Gitrog monster, I see zero reason to play this card. Total F. Next up, we have a cycle of uncommon lands. We have Forsaken Sanctuary, Foul Orchard, Highland Lake, Stone Quarry, and Woodland Stream. Each of these cards are a land at uncommon. They say Forsaken Sanctuary, or whatever the name is, enters the battlefield tapped. Tap, add white or black to your mana pool, or whatever color combination the land says. Yeah, not much else to say about this. Uh, you need it if you're in those colors. If you're not, you don't. Like the guild gates, like the uncommon lands from uh, Battle for Zendikar, don't load up on these, or I think they were an oath. Um, don't load up on them. You know, you don't want a huge amount of these because they do enter tapped, so they're a little bit slow, but they help fix your mana. They help you splash a little bit. If you need it, you need it. If you don't, you don't. Middle of the road C. Next up, we have Warped Landscape. Warped Landscape is a land at common. It says tap, add colorless to your mana pool. Pay two, tap, sacrifice Warped Landscape. Search your library for a basic land card and put it onto the battlefield tapped. Then shuffle your library. Uh, this isn't, uh, you know, Evolving Wilds. It's costly, but still, we don't have an Evolving Wild, so it still is going to serve the same purpose. It taps for mana, though, which is nice, whereas Evolving Wilds does not tap for mana. So we can use this until we need to to go and get that land uh you know we don't have to play this turn one tap and go and get the land uh it taps for mana but it doesn't fix your mana early on like evolving wilds does unfortunately still this is so solidly helping your splash or, or helping you fix your mana that you you need to get it helps make uh you know slightly less keepable hands more keepable um look to pick these more around pack two or three when you know you're going to head towards a splash but all in all i i think i like it a fair bit and it even helps out delirium just a little bit by getting a land into the graveyard so c plus i think you'll play it more often than not all right, we've made it. The final card of Shadows over Innistrad, Westvale Abbey. Westvale Abbey is a land at rare. It says tap, add colorless to your mana pool. Pay five generic mana, tap, pay a life. Put a 1-1 white and black human cleric creature token onto the battlefield. Pay five, tap, sacrifice five creatures, transform Westvale Abbey, then untap it. It becomes... Ormental, Profane Prince, a legendary creature demon at rare. It's a 9-7. It has flying. It has lifelink. It has un indestructible. And it also has haste. Yeah, wow. That's, uh, that's a whole lot of abilities there. Um, this seems ever so slightly cute and of course super awesome for EDH in any sort of casual format. Sacking five creatures is going to be the slight problem here um, but if you can put this into like a green white tokens deck that's making a bunch of human tokens or spirit tokens or both by the time this comes down by the time you play this and have five mana and you can transform this the turn it comes down or a turn after this thing's going to be basically unbeatable i mean how do you kill this thing it's a nine seven indestructible 
So you're going to have to exile it or you're going to have to give it minus seven somehow. Uh, I don't see that happening too often. Or they're going to have to make you sacrifice a creature and there's not much that does that. Basically, if you flip this, you win the game. There's very little that's going to stop you from winning the game if you can flip this. So I probably will end up taking this first pick if I do open it and desperately trying to make it work, desperately trying to get a tokens deck, trying to get as many creatures as I can on the battlefield by the time I draw this and am able to play it. Um, yeah, geez. This is really, really all based on whether or not you can flip it. If you can't flip it, it's just not that good. Five mana to make a 1-1 one, one, and, you know, five turns after that to get enough 1-1s one, in order to flip it. Uh, and tapping for colorless mana just isn't very good. But if you can flip it, and I'm pretty sure that you can build a deck where this would be flippable, um, even if you have to make a 1-1, one, one, take a turn to make a 1-1 one, one off this to get your fifth creature. This should just be ridiculously solid. I've got to give it a B plus. Um, it's not going to get into A range just because you do have to jump through some hoops to get into this, but those hoops have one hell of a payoff, so B+. Plus. All right, so that's going to wrap it up for the Shadows over Innistrad set review. I do have just a few kind of overview notes that I want to uh, kind of address. First off is archetypes and cool decks. Be on the lookout for cool decks. One of the things that Innistrad was known for was having cool decks that popped up a month after the set came up, two months, three months after the set came up. People were still discovering new decks, of course, the most famous of which was Spider Spawning. But be on the lookout for those. I have a feeling they probably want Lightning to Strike twice and have attempted to seed some cool decks in here. Uh, I've noted a few cards that have that potential, but be on the lookout. Another thing I want to address is Madness. Uh, a lot of people have been uh, pretty critical of my ratings on Madness and Madness Enablers, and I, I don't mean to be critical on Madness. It's certainly a powerful, powerful mechanic. It's fantastic that you can discard a card, which normally would be a downside, and cast it instead. So if you're discarding a card and drawing a card, you're instead playing a card and drawing a card, and that's great. However, if you look at the set, there are 10 common and uncommon red and black madness cards and then there's a couple in blue and not all of them are good or playable there's a couple that are bad or sideboardable and there's a couple that are kind of borderline so there's not that many madness cards that you're going to have access to and a number of them are so good that every black and red player is going to want to have them fiery temper you don't have to be a madness deck to want to play fiery temper you just simply have to be playing red Red, white, red, black, red, blue, red, green. Every single red deck is going to be taking that card. So do not expect that you're always going to have a hand just chock full of madness cards. I've seen a lot of people just kind of presume that, oh, if I discard, hey, if I have to discard a card for something, I'm just going to discard a madness card. You are not always going to have that option. It's going to be, in fact, I think kind of hard to have a deck that is going to have, you know, more than maybe seven madness cards. I just don't think it's something you can super expect, especially since most of the good ones are living it on common instead of common. Don't get me wrong. I think Madness is fantastic. I think it's super powerful. But don't expect it to just be a default if you're discarding a card, you're casting it. There's going to be a lot of times where you're going to have to discard a land or even worse you know, something that you'd rather play instead. Um, Color-wise, I think red seems to be the best uh, deck or, or the best uh, color. I think it supports a number of different decks. It pairs with every color very, very well. Green also seems pretty darn solid along with black. White seems slightly weak to me, but enough applicable creatures to be aggressive. Uh, I think white will really kind of fill the low-end creatures. They'll be your two drops and some one drops but probably not too many and there's some nice tricks and removal in white as well blue seems the weakest to me but also seems to have a ton of good support stuff a lot of bounce a lot of counter a lot of tempo stuff some decent zombies to go into blue black zombies some decent spells to go into blue red spells uh, i think it's a weak color as a majority color but i think it will pair pretty well with the rest of the colors as a a, a second color um, but yeah, that's going to wrap it up for my set review. I don't have too many other points to really address. I just hope that everybody does really well at their pre-releases, and I want to hear how you do at your pre-releases. There will be no Spiky Saturday this week. Spiky Saturday will be delayed until Monday.
Monday, where I'll do a a pre-release recap of my big pre-release on Saturday and my slightly smaller pre-release on Sunday. So stay tuned for that and definitely let me know on Monday when I post that video how your pre-releases went. How did you do? What did you win? What awesome cards did you open? Did you find any of these awesome potential archetypes that are out there? Let me know how wrong I was about Madness and how you played a 23 Madness card deck. Um, Let me know all of that, of course. Uh, As well, I wanted to thank everybody for sharing my videos to Reddit and Twitter and everywhere else. This uh, is looking to be the best set review I've had so far, stats-wise. A huge boost in subscribers. Welcome to everybody who's a new subscriber. By the way, we're going to be back to our regularly weekly scheduled videos next week, so you can hopefully enjoy those uh, while we enjoy Shadows Over Innistrad. But as always, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, you can find me on Twitter at the Manalik, that's L-E-E-K, like the vegetable, not the card. And you can also find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash themanalik. You've already found me here on YouTube. You've got that comment section down below. Please make use of that. Let me know what you think about this format, uh, the artifacts, the lands, the gold uh, spells, and just the format in general. As well, if you like my videos, please click that little thumbs up icon and you should subscribe. We are at the end of set reviews, so you're not going to be looking for the next set review to come up, but you probably want to see how my pre-release goes and uh, Uh, That's going to be up, as I said, on Monday. You're going to want to see the top 10 Thursdays to do with Shadows Over Innistrad. And, of course, you're going to want to see that very first over-the-shoulder draft of the first Friday Night Magic Shadows Over Innistrad draft. That will be up next Spiky Saturday, uh, the day after release. So make sure you are subscribed. There's that button below each video, and there's one in the outro. But as always, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, let me know. Otherwise, see you all next time.